as well, the Phoenix Society. We're going to be talking about one of my interpretations from the first play of Lignitzer's Sword and Buckler. I'm actually going to be operating from the interpretation uh, that Corey Winslow and Mike Edelson had uh, from a video they did earlier a couple months ago, um, where they discussed the Ringek and Bandanze gloss, uh, where the gloss is commenting on the part of the Zettel, uh, which describes hewing with the whole body to the head and to the body, and threatening with a point denying our opponent the ability to change through. I'm not going to go into the whole video, it's a really good video, go watch it, but essentially what I'm going to try to do today is apply that same interpretation that Mike Edelson and Corey Winslow had for the ring at Longsword to Sword and Buckler because I think it solves some problems that Sword and Buckler has. So Adam Simmons is going to help me demonstrate some of the issues we have with Sword and Buckler uh, operating from some of the old methodologies. So one of the very first problems we have when we run into with Sword and Buckler is if I'm attacking Adam Simmons, um, Adam Simmons, theoretically, if I'm attacking to him, does not need to use his sword to protect himself. It may not be the most ideal thing, but he can use the buckler solely, theoretically, to protect himself. So the problem is, and this is the very first play in Paul's Cow, uh, is that if I strike Adam Simmons to the head, he hits the buckler. Adam Simmons is then free to hew me without a step anywhere below. In fact, that's all it says. Paul's Cow says he actually blocks with the buckler and then he hews me below where he chooses. Uh, does that to say that I cannot still win from that position if I strike him and he blocks a slow buckler? No, I can still win from there. There's a counter to that. But I, the problem is, is we've all seen this in sparring sort of buckler terms. Probably one of the most common things we ever see is someone throws a strike, someone blocks with just the buckler, and that person flails below and hits them. Okay, very common. One of the ways in which we may be able to counter this though is instead of looking at the first play and Lignitzer or as a overhaul to directly committed to the head or to the band, we can basically translate it and interpret it the same way that Mike Edelson and Corey Lunds were doing from the longsword losses, which is to say that in Lignitzer it says, it advocates that when we commit the overhaul, we are striking to the man, bringing our sword near our buckler, near our thumb, and then we are going to threaten with the point from below. So, if we're looking at this from the same idea as the long sword, instead of me cutting committed to the head, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to threaten with the point just outside of my opponent's measure and just outside of my own end. So now I'm cutting, I might look at where my point ends up. My point actually ends on the inside of his bucket. This is not so dissimilar to how the way 133 works with its obsessions, besiegements, or displacements. For example, so we're doing the first play in 133, and my opponent here is an air shield. And I go from first ward, and I fall underneath my opponent's sword and shield. It's not necessarily a direct attack. And I know there's a lot of interpretations on this, but this is a, this is a simple way of looking at it. If I fall under my opponent's sword and shield, I'm falling past his defenses, and now he's forced to deal at this point, which causes him to do more than everything else. So this could be, in fact, not dissimilar to what the ligaments are advocating. I'm not necessarily throwing the overhaul with the hue to the head, but I'm committing the overhaul, I'm threatening with the sword, and now my opponent, if he binds with me, which he needs to, because if he doesn't, he dies with the thrust, I do certain things. The play that ligaments are advocates is if he displaces me, I can wind the point, he pushes me off, and then I'm cutting to the head. Okay, but we could use all of the other same plays that Von Danzig advocates in the longsword section from this very same play. Uh, so, for example, Von Danzig says that if I, if I throw this over how and he binds me strongly, instead of me cutting to the head, I can throw a light cut to the wrists, okay, or to the hand. The other thing I can do is, if he decides to bind really high up against this over how, I can throw, I can throw this, the free you to the body, just like Von Danzig says, okay? But the most important thing about this is, one, I'm forcing my opponent to deal with my point, okay? And I'm keeping myself in a safe measure. So, if I come in here and I threaten with this point, if Adam just stands there and swings and flails at me, he's out of measure. He can't hit me in my legs, he can't thrust me. If I step, it's a longer tempo. And if he steps, he's in it, he take a longer tempo. Um, so, it's a really good way to rethink maybe some of the ways we've been doing sword and buckler, at least from the KDF Lignitzer um, standpoint. Um, they make it a little safer to do some of the fights, and 
I'm not saying this is correct, but it did get me thinking and I'm giving kudos to Mike Elson, which is hard for me to say, though. Marazzo might call it a provocation. There you go. I hate Marazzo. <laughs>